And yes, Michelle, it, there is a recording. We're going to be recording this one tonight as well. So for uh, since she, since the question has been posed, if you were not able to attend last night, uh, the session was recorded. Uh, so yes, you can still take a take a peek at all the awesomeness that was happening yesterday. Mm. All right. So we'll go ahead and jump into it. Actually, you know what? I told Anita we're gonna just start talking about stuff right away. So, so the deck itself, are you not ready yet? You want you want to you want us to get warmed up or you want to get into it? So I, I love just getting to it because it'll help as we go through. It's a little bit different, but I I I treat this like we at the house. We having a conversation. This isn't the stuff you the stuff you probably already know. Stuff will be a review for some people. Maybe there are a few tidbits that you know that we can uh, kind of shed some new light on or kind of expose to. And, and Anita, before I come to you, just really quickly, if this is your first time joining us, my name is Jasper Smith, also known as Mr. Bill Wealth, and this is my. I'll say second adventure with Occur, and I'm just excited that they keep thinking of me <laughs> to come and do the, these types of sessions around educating our, our community. And I'm just excited again to be here tonight to talk about tonight. Is, the topic is around credit and how we can get you into the 720 plus club. Now, the average, and I just actually looked this data up last night. <laughs> Average FICO score, which is the score we'll talk about for tonight, is the average uh, is 711. That's the average score. And we know some people are well above that, well below it, but you know, that that average doesn't tell the true story. But you know, I always say the 720 plus because that's where I want people to strive for. So we're gonna do something a little different tonight because Anita showed up. So I, I'm not even gonna hop into my deck and, and give y'all the other good background. We're gonna hop right into it and then I'll hop into the deck. And you know, we're gonna do something a little different where we, this way we don't, you know, wait till the end. We can kind of get some of the questions and conversations out. I can still get through the deck pretty quickly. Um, and actually probably what I'll probably mention to some of my responses may coincide with the, the deck itself. So I know this is a recorded session. I probably should stick to the script, but I like switching it up. So Anita, I want you to go ahead and uh, you had a question yesterday during the session and I wanted to make sure we address that right off the bat before we hopped into things. So Anita, if you're okay. kind enough to go ahead and share your question. Okay, thank you. Um, I am Anita Latin. I had a question on last night because I thought you had already covered the tax or the credit section. Um, but what I was saying was that I was fortunate enough to be able to pay off bills and then I thought I was doing a good thing. And um, lo and behold, my, script, my, my credit score plummeted. And um, to me, it's amazing that I've worked for 42 years, I've paid bills, and now all of a sudden I'm a high risk because I don't have debt. Doesn't make sense to me. I know that that's the plan of the man to keep us oppressed and keep us locked down. But the Bible says that all we are supposed to owe anybody is to love them. So I was doing what the Bible says and I got penalized by the man. So I need some rec rec restitution so I can get my score up to 720 and above. So how do I do that? <laughs> so, so, so and I remember you said last night, you just recently retired or? I did. Okay. July so. 2007, no, 2019. So just a year, almost two years ago. Nice. Congratulations, first off, for retiring. Um, now, are you going to pursue some new passion or career in this second phase? I am or, in or next phase? ministry right now. I'm the executive ah. pastor of my church. I have my own ministry, and I am trying to uh, restructure and reinstate my nonprofit. So I got plenty to do. Perfect. So you about and to be I'm trying busy. to finish up a doctoral degree. So yeah. I'm busy. I I already know she's gonna be more busy, quote unquote, in retiring than she was while she was working. Y'all, y'all, y'all know that's the game, right? We work yeah. all hard and and then <laughs> you retire. Like, oh, I'm gonna have all this free time. No, you're not. You go, no. you're gonna keep volunteering for stuff. So, uh, but yeah. but again, congrat congratulations on on that for yeah. you know getting to that point in your life where most people they don't have that that opportunity. But the the thing I was gonna bring up when you mentioned retirement and, and having a good credit score, it, is there a real need to have good credit at this point? Not really. I just want to have it so I can say I got it. It's a goal. All right. Perfect. Perfect. So, 
here's here's the, here's the thing with credit. Once you have, and this is what I tell people, once you purchase all your big ticket items, your house, your boat, your yacht, your motorcycle, at some point, credit isn't that important. And, you know, unless you're still like in business and you're going to be leveraging it for, for business purposes, it's, it's to your point, it's just kind of a bragging thing. It's like the people who say, I want to get to an 800. A 790 is still good. So it, it, is it a personal kind of gripe or is it I really need to get it up for some other uh, need, if you will? B because I challenge people on this. Of if, And here's the example I like to give. So uh, if I'm retired and I had this conversation with my dad, he, he did pretty well during his working years. He don't care if I have a good credit. Now his credit is still good. But he don't care. If you got millions in the bank and you got all your assets and all your toys, is credit really that important? No, because you can pay for whatever you want. <laughs> yes. So, so look, this is it, it's tough for people to 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 like to to um, digest that. Like, it isn't that important at some point in your life. Now, again, if, if I'm trying to maybe be an example for my children, my grandchildren, and, and then they're asking you those questions, you know, then maybe you want to start to work on it so you can prove to them that having good credit is attainable. But for, for a lot of people, we're, we're so concerned about our credit scores and things like that, when is it really that important at, at, a, at this point in your life? And yeah, I know people want to get, get it up and get the score looking good, but do you have other things that are more important in terms of your priority list of your, when you think about your overall financial plan, are there other important things? And so credit, while it may seem important right now, if you're thinking about everything that you're doing, it's, it's not number one on your list. I already know that. And I only, and I just met you yesterday. <laughs> so, but this is the type of, you know, uh, conversation I like having with people when I get you to start thinking about how credit fits into the whole scheme. You know, credit is a, is a game that has to be played, or if you're not going to play the credit game, you need to have a lot of cash. So those are your, all, all your alternatives. So people say, well, I, I don't like dealing with credit. I live in cash. I hope you have a lot of cash, not like a few hundred dollars. A few, I mean, if you have millions, you don't need credit. Right, you can just right. go buy stuff. But for, for, for the average person, we have to use leverage. Like we have to have credit to get the house. Most people can't save enough for the down payment, let alone to pay off the mortgage. So you have to borrow. Most of us don't save enough to go buy a car cash. Some people do. But for the, the, the luxury items, you're like, ah, maybe, maybe I don't save all that money or invest it and then go spend it on you know, some, some tangible uh, thing, if you will. So I, I like the fact that you want to improve your credit. But if it's not the top priority, I wouldn't care. But that's just me. If you care that much, and you want to devote all this great time in your life to trying to boost up your score when you have, I'll say, other uh, important priorities or obligations, then, then perhaps you let it ride. Well, I do have to consider the fact that eventually I need to buy property for my business, my foundation. So, right. I mean, the foundation will have money, but somebody has to be the responsible person, the signer. So if they look at my credit, and say, uh, uh um, but I'm putting in money, you know. So I, I'm, yep. I'm thinking in that term as well. Now you've added an entirely different element. So, so, right. so yes, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, and, and and we know business credit is different from personal credit. But when you're starting out a business, you, they're going to look at the personal for a, a limited amount of time, even if you have your own separate business entity. Like I'm going through that process right now, so they're still going to look at me as the personal. Right. in order to maybe give me the credit for the business. But at some point, I need to have complete separation from the two. So now, Anita, yes, I do believe boosting your score is important. <laughs> all right. <laughs> but, but, so, but again, if you all are not going into business and you get to that point in your life where you've gotten everything you wanted, credit really isn't that important. I'd rather you focus on saving money, working on your health and your mental, like work on everything else. C credit at some point will not be as important. It's just once we get it to a certain spot, it's about maintaining, right? So, you know, it, it since some, uh, thank you, Anita, for sharing. I appreciate you, you know, coming. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead, and, we had a couple more questions in the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of, we'll, we'll flip the script and do the question stuff up front since we have some, some engagement. 
So we have another question around uh, collections. Uh, oh, yeah, so, all right, so thank you, Rochelle. This is, a, this is common. So a collection account, uh, didn't have any, one pops up, should I pay? That, that's that's the, the, the question. Uh, it depends. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, score if the score is high or all your scores are high and this is the one blemish, I may not be concerned with it, but the question is like, do you actually owe it? Like, is it you? Because if it wasn't there and then it all of a sudden popped up, maybe that's something you might want to dispute and just ensure that you actually owe the debt. So that, that's normally my, my first response is, well, one, do you owe it? Two, if it just popped up out of nowhere, like I kind of wanted them to verify that it, it could be me. And, and if it's not a, I'll say a large amount, it might be just worth paying them off, maybe, right? So, so credit is one of these kind of, I know we always want like the, uh, like that silver bullet, like what, what should we do? And it, it always will depend on the entire situation. So for people who give like blanket advice on anything financial, I, I cringe because it's always going to, going to depend on a number of factors and credit is no different. If again, if all of my scores are 800 and I have one little blemish, I don't really care. And I'm gonna give you all my perspective because my scores are that high. The collection is a, is a minor blemish if everything else looks really good. So, so Rochelle, hopefully that, that answered the question. Um, and I didn't see this, but we just talked about having an 800. So Michelle, thank you. <laughs> so how do you get an 800? Um, have access to a lot of credit, keep your balances really low and have stuff for a very long time. That's the secret sauce. So if you, you know, have a couple of, I'll say trade lines and you had them for a very long time and your balances have always kind of been you know, reasonable or reasonably low, you know, the 800 is just kind of a time thing for most people. It's have you been doing the right thing for a sustained period of time? And even if you've borrowed, have you been always paying stuff on time? So you can still have debt and have a, a 800 score. It's just more of a time factor. And they're looking at everything, which is going to help you get into that 800 range. Uh, for some people, I've run into this, they want the 800 for bragging rights. You, you don't get like extra gold stars in my book. Uh, but but I'm not a lender, and just what I've heard from people who are in lending, a 790 is kind of just as good as an 800. Generally speaking, every lender is different. I am not a lender. I don't claim to be, <laughs> but just say you have 800, you're not that much better than me if I have a 795 or a 780. Good for bragging rights. You can brag. Um, if that's what you want to do, then keep working to get the bragging rights. Uh, all right, so we got a couple more good questions here. So this is good. And I knew this was going to happen for credit, y'all. So that's why I want to tackle the questions up front because credit always starts a good conversation. So uh, let me keep getting through these. Uh, all right, so I think we just had a question. Oh, we were just talking about like building credit for like your business. Um, so Anita mentioned that. And again, business credit, totally separate from personal credit. Um, so you do need to establish another entity with a, a, you know, a tax ID number and you want to, you want to just start something. Um, I've, I've known some business owners where if you're driving around a lot, maybe the first thing you do for the business is get a gas card to start that process of building credit for the business. So, you know, I, I'm not a business credit expert, but again, from all my research has been, it's kind of the same process. You got to start someplace. They, they may look at you as the individual for that what's called a personal guarantee to, to get the trade line, but you do want to have like complete separation at some point. So if you got to start out and use your personal for, for now, so be it, but you want to have that uh, tax ID or your EIN or yeah, your tax ID number to the entity itself, the business should have the credit. So it should be a business address, business phone number. You want complete separation at some point from the two. So in case something happens with the business, still you're kind of protected from the individual side. So I, I learned this because I have a business credit card that I got very early in my career, but it was just using, my, I still use my social. 
So <laughs> it says business on the card, but I signed up under my social. But because it's a business account, it doesn't show up on my credit report, my personal report. So subtle differences, but things to consider if you're trying to establish credit for a business, then you do want to have that, that separation. Um, all right, so Michelle has another question around, explain the way scores are analyzed. Couldn't tell you, Michelle, I'm not a lender. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't know if they will tell us exactly their process, but if you reach out to any lending organization, whether it's a bank, credit union, or mortgage lender, uh, they, that is the question you want to ask them in terms of how they look at your scores and do they have some way, weighting or, yeah, do they have more weight on one score versus the other or are they looking at a combination of all three? So that's a great question to ask an actual lender, uh, Michelle, because I, I do not know. And, and everybody has a different, I'll say, recipe in terms of how they will um, make a decision about the loan you may be going at. <laughs> and so Michelle, long time, 15, 20 years. I mean, it's like, you don't just wake up and get an 800 credit score, but I, I've seen, there may be some, some um, exceptions to that rule where if you started out when you were a teenager and you maybe have a good, you know, you started out good and never got into trouble, you know, an 800 might be possible in a shorter time frame than that. But I, I don't know how long, there's no, I, I don't think there's an exact number of if you do X, Y, it'll equal Z. I just don't think that exists. And, and that's credit in a nutshell. Credit is just, it's not, credit is not as cut and dry as I would like. And so as you think about credit in general, just know there's some things we'll never have the answers to. But there are certain things that I know to be true that if we do these, it will put you in a better situation from a, a credit standpoint. All right, so we got a lot of activity. All right, so Rochelle's asking uh, if they, um, so, Rochelle, I think you're mentioning, you know, if, if uh, um, time. So, yeah, with time, sometimes things go away. You know, I, I sometimes recommend, depending on the situation, waiting could be a benefit if, you know, it's um, like for collection accounts, for example, they have this seven-year rule, which everybody kind of has heard about. Problem with waiting is sometimes it gets missing, sometimes it doesn't. And I've seen this seven year rule kind of play out in live time because I've done credit counseling at a nonprofit before and still help clients with it, but I've seen it disappear and then show up later. So although we hope things fall off if we avoid them long enough, they can always come back up. Um, so this is why we'll talk about, you know, getting your reports and just checking to make sure because if you're not checking and being proactive, things could be happening without you knowing. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so, oh, business credit. So business credit is reported to, I believe is Dun & Bradstreet, Equifax and Experian are the big three for business credit. Um, so again, Experian, Equifax, which also do personal, but then you have um, like Dun & Bradstreet, which is another company that houses a ton of information strictly business. So those three kind of hold the, the bigger weighting from a business side. And, and, and again, I'm not a business credit expert, but again, from my research, I do know those three because I heard a guy talk about it <laughs> and I've read articles about it. But yeah, the, it's, it's your Dun & Bradstreet, um, Equifax and Experian have more of uh, the business focus on your credit or business credit focus. All right. Woo, all right. So this is good. I, I knew this was gonna happen tonight with credit. So I'm glad we were able to kind of tackle some questions. And now I'm actually gonna hop into, a, uh, again, a, a short deck that I have put together. And, and that way we can still make sure to give you kind of that foundation stuff that everybody needs to know. Uh, but I, I thank everybody for, for those questions initially because credit is still one of the most misunderstood things out here. And it's still holding a lot of us back and it doesn't have to be that way. So give me one moment. <laughs> I'm going to pull up my presentation. We'll get through this and then I will 
Um, we'll get back to some more, some more Q&A. So once this comes up, um, so I'll save you all the, the uh, long drawn out introduction like we did last night, but I'm Jasper Smith again, Mr. Bill Wealth, uh, founder of the Bill Wealth Movement. My mission, three words, you won't forget it. Disrupting generational poverty is what I'm all about. So in every effort that I do, I just want us to do something different to improve the likelihood that we can have a more prosperous uh, life financially, but also for generations to come. So I always put goals with credit because credit is one of those things that, you know, we kind of need some, some actionable kind of items or things to address. And so as it relates to credit, I want you to think about your goals personally. Are, are there things you can do right now, like with your credit to address it? And that's, you know, a quick win like today, tomorrow, next week, just something quickly to get you moving in the proper direction uh, if you're working on improving or enhancing your credit or if you're just starting. So setting some, some quick wins that will, will help guide you. And once we get some, some easy wins under our belt, let's focus on some big wins. So if you got that credit card payment that's been looming, you're like, you know what, I, I gotta get that balance down. You know, maybe it's gonna take you three months, six months, or even a year. But that's a big win when you get that, that, uh, that credit card paid off. So the last one, toughest part is the ongoing victory. And I always put this in, in the credit discussion because some of us, our spending habits are the reason we have bad credit. It's just our habits. And, and some of them, they're gonna be hard to shake, but we had to keep trying. And, and so those ongoing victories are maybe the most challenging because we're dealing with our habits, which are so ingrained in us that we just, we can't, we can't get out of our own way. Or we, we never got the proper information from the get-go. So therefore, we're, again, in this mess because we, we were never explained credit in a, in a proper manner. So think about those three things as we're, we're going through the session. So what is credit? Basic definition, the ability of a customer to obtain goods or services before payment based on trust. Keyword, trusting you. Payment will be made in the future. And if you need a shorter definition, OPM, that's what all that credit is. And that stands for other people's money. So if somebody ever says, what is credit? You can say OPM and I'm gonna type this into the chat or you just put other people's money. Simple definition. You don't have to use the one that you see here on your screen. The big three for, and again, we're talking about personal credit more so tonight. So the, the big three, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian, all three are important. All three compute your score differently. All three will never show your score the exact same. I've never seen two scores match up. They've been close, but I've never seen, if you looked at your, if you got a score from any one of these three, they will never equal. Now, don't ask why, because I do not know. But here's what I do know. So don't ask, don't ask why it's not equal. But here's what I do know. If I ask three people on this session to, to bake an apple pie, I know all three of those pies are going to taste a little bit different. That's how I want you to think about how your credit scores are computed. <laughs> so if, if you can remember that analogy, just you got three different recipes. Somebody's going to do a little something different with their pie. And, and that's how they look at your score. It's a similar formula but they're making little tweaks here and there. So they're never gonna be the exact same number. Um, so so neither, uh, all three are important, all three. And I'm glad you asked that question. And the reason I say all three are important is because I'm not a lender. So a lender may say, you know what? We have a relationship with Equifax. So we're gonna put more weight on the Equifax report and the score. And you're not gonna know that information. So I say all three are important because you do not know what the lender is looking at. I'd hate for you to be, and this is, this is the true story, the person who loves Credit Karma, Credit Karma gives you TransUnion and Equifax and you don't have Experian. So I get these people who almost have this false sense of like, I'm doing very, very well and you may be doing well, but something could be looming on that Experian report. So I'm gonna say all the time, all three are important. There's not one that is more important than the other. Unless you're going for a loan and you find out on the inside that they're only looking at one report or two reports, then maybe I would change my tune. But uh, as of this recording, all three of these companies are important, all three. 
So the score, the higher the better. I'm not going to – y'all know, I don't have to shed much light on that one. But I do want to give you a nice visual of why it does matter when you're thinking about, you know, improving the score. And I think this, this, this image here with the car loan is – pretty indicative of what you, you would have to deal with uh, because it, it literally, it's more expensive the worse off your credit is. It's more expensive just for you to get the same thing. So the same car getting $10,000, you can see the final cost for the person who has the 580 versus the person who has the 670. So it is expensive to have bad credit. Literally, it is expensive. So just remember this, you wanna improve your scores, it, it can take some time to do it, but it's worth it because it will save you a ton of money in the long run. The other thing about the score and, and credit in general is your like a story is being told about you and you're not there to defend yourself. That's why credit is really important. You, you, you don't... Um, you don't have any chance. You just, somebody looks at a report or a number and they make an assessment about your character. So in that, in that definition of credit, we talked about trust. I can't trust you just from looking at this paper and seeing you have a 550 versus the person who has a 750. I'm gonna trust the 750 way more. And they could be the greatest person in the world who has that 550 or five, whatever. They could be the greatest person in the world. But on this report, I am judging you right here and there judging you and you're not there to tell me a story because your story is irrelevant it, it literally is if i'm a lender i don't care about your life i care about let's see what's on this report that's going to help me make all the assumptions that i need about you and i don't even know you that's why credit is so important um before i get before i get into the score um and this is just the breakdown of the fico score but here's the other thing, too, that I always mention around why your, your credit is important. It, it affects your job, potentially. If you are renting, your landlord could maybe not allow you to rent. Like, it, it, here's a job. Here's the job thing. So if I'm in business, and, and let's say um, I'm considering hiring Rochelle, and I'm like, Rochelle, you know, I got to do my background check. I want to check your credit. And if I see that Rochelle has just not been able to manage her credit effectively, I might not hire Rochelle because if she can't manage her own money, how do I have the confidence that she can manage mine? And, and maybe Rochelle has turned this corner, you know, she's living a whole new life. But when I look at that report, I get an immediate assessment of her character and level of trustworthiness. So she has all these late payments. You know, if she has, you know, a, a, 100 collection accounts, she might be a problem for me as an employer. You know, renting, if you're always late, as your landlord, how, know, how do I know you're going to pay me on time? Yeah. So I'm, I'm making an assessment about your character. And I, I don't know you. You could have had a rough patch in your life where it messed everything up. Kind of irrelevant, because all I have to go off is a report. Yeah. It's definitely a barrier. Mm -hmm. I mean, negative, bad credit is it's a real barrier. It is. And I know we joke about having bad credit. It's like this, you know, all Black folks got bad credit. I don't laugh at the joke because I've never had bad credit. So I don't even laugh. I'm like, it's unfortunate that we, we laugh at the struggle, but I would rather us laugh and we all have 720s. Then we can laugh. <laughs> we all have great credit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but, but we don't. And, you know, I showed the example of the breakdown of the score of FICO. You can see where the attention really is. It's your history and the amounts you owe. The other three categories, more people ask questions about those despite seeing this diagram. It never fails. You know, I'm like, payment history and amounts you owe, 65%. And people say, well, what about all the inquiries? And what about this? I'm like, look, look at the chart. Look at the, look at the pie. <laughs> yeah. Keep we, we got to keep the main thing the main thing, and, and and we know this formula, but we sometimes get distracted with small things that aren't that important. Yes, you should not be applying for a new credit card every time you go to the store. Oh, you can save twenty percent. Don't don't do it. <laughs> you don't need that much new credit. You know the types of credit 
this is, you know, uh, an installment versus revolving. So an installment is like a, a loan, same payment every time, every month. Revolving, just three credit cards. That minimum payment always fluctuates. So installment means same type, you know, same payment amount, revolving different payment amount. And so when they look at types of credit, although it's 10%, they want to see, you know, can you manage both? You know, so a real life example is I never had student loans. And so I only had credit cards. And so I actually took out a personal loan to have an installment. And all I did was shift around some of my debt from credit cards to the personal loan. And then my score went up just because I had never had an installment type of debt on my report. So I thought it was stupid. But somebody's like, why do you have to take out more debt to boost your score? I'm just playing the game, y'all. I stopped asking the question of why. <laughs> my score said it wasn't high enough. And I said, how can I get it up? They said, get an installment. Yeah. So I did. So I, I didn't, I didn't, well, why is this and why? You, you got to stop asking the why behind credit. You just got to know this formula works. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any less debt. I just shifted it from a credit card to a personal loan. So I get the personal loan, pay off the credit card, and now I owe the one payment that's the same amount every month for the personal loan for like a year. So credit score went up. Yeah. But when I look at the history and the amounts that I owe, you should never be, you know, near your limits. If you are, maybe you need more limits, you know, or maybe you need to work on those habits because it's inherently, it's not bad to max out your card. It's only bad if you max it out and don't pay off the balance in full. Let me say that again in case somebody missed it. So maxing out your card is not inherently bad. It's only bad if you don't pay off the full balance at the end of the, of the month. And is that because you have to pay interest on that or? That's exactly right. Yep. So. So what about if it's a large purchase and you know it's going to take you six or seven payments to make it? Yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah. L large payments. Yeah, you're not just coming out of pocket all that money, and that's okay. But in that case where you have a bigger ticket purchase, I know your interest rate is not as high as a credit card. Yeah. So if you got a car loan, student loan, mortgage, I know that rate without looking at you. I know the rate is lower than your credit card. Credit cards is what's eating people alive. And it's their spending habits, which is causing them an issue. So here's another fun thing uh, <laughs> that my mom taught me when I was learning about credit is the interest rate really only applies for those big ticket items, right? Because you're going to have the debt for a substantial period of time. But for credit card, you got to get in the habit of paying it off in, in 30 days. So a credit card is an interest-free loan for 30 days. On day 31, a payment needs to be made, whether it's the minimum or all of it. Mm -hmm. So we, we get to this notion of Interest rates are so important, but I got to change the way you all think about this. It's only important if you're going to be borrowing for a long time. So with credit cards, use the car, pay it off. 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 Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know some people say, well, keep a small balance. That, that makes no sense to me. And here's why it makes no sense. Why pay the bank or your credit union interest on anything when you could have paid them off in full. If anybody can explain to me how this makes sense, you let me know. I understand borrowing, but it, it, with these credit cards, and I've heard somebody say this, well, you should keep like a small balance to show that you're active. No, no, no. no. Active means you use the car, pay it off. Use the car, pay it off. I'm active. Well, you know, I had planned on paying off one of my credit cards, but then COVID hit. And all of the advice from like Susie Orman and Lynn Richardson, the financial gurus said, make the minimum payment and that is it. Do not try and be a hero and pay the credit card balances off during this time, period in time because so, of the pandemic. Yeah, so, so again, we're going to sources, they're giving blanket advice. So yeah. here's my problem with any, I'll say, talking head that's on TV or who's famous. They don't know your whole situation. Yeah. 
you know, that's my only, so I give blanket statements and advice. Some people take it, some people don't, but Mm -hmm. they don't know about your situation. So I'm not going to say it's the proper thing to do or not to do, but during the pandemic, if, uh, and this happened to some of my clients, they, they're, um, uh, car loans. They were like, we'll freeze your payments for three months. And I was like, great. You should go pay off all your other credit cards and save and invest that money for three months, knowing in month number four, we got to start making payments again. So that's a very unique situation on their strategy. So if you're playing the minimum game and you're like, well, I have a lot of cards, we'll pay the minimum on some and load up and get rid of the other debt on others. Because if, you just, if you're not going to pay off the debt during the pandemic, the debt doesn't go away when the pandemic is over. Like, you're not going to get this, oh, the pandemic's over today notice. Like, you're not getting that. So when you get that blanket advice, think about who they're talking to. Are they talking to you? And do they know your entire situation? Right. So we, we got to think about, and this is why credit, that's why people get so much bad information, because they keep listening to advice but they never look and think about how does this affect my situation? Right. And and in reality, credit card, like you said, credit card debt at 22, 25% is very costly to carry balance. Absolutely. And again, I'm I'm, I'm all for credit. I love credit. All I use is credit cards. But all I use, I, I pay off, I spend the money, I pay it off. My scores are very high. They always have been. Wasn't always there. But I realized that I got to play this game. And, and again, if you're not thinking about how all this plays into your situation, this is when you get into trouble because you get all the advice, but then you don't sit down and think about, well, how do I take that advice and apply it to me? All right. So, so think about the score and, you know, you got two important areas. Some of the other stuff, it's not as important as, as some people lead on. Um, so let me get through a couple more slides. We've got a couple more questions and I'm gonna be um, mindful of the time we have. So the rights, I'll kind of flash this one up here briefly. There's some rules <laughs> that apply when you're trying to get credit, when you're working on cleaning up your credit, how credit and stuff is even reported. These are important when you're you know, trying to settle things or if, if, if errors come up, like, you know, th- these are the, you know, you have rights. And if you ever find yourself in a jam, maybe there's something in these, you know, these rules or these laws that could help you prove your case. Again, everybody's in a, you know, has a different situation when they're trying to clean things up or even when there's fraudulent stuff is happening, but you have some, some, some protections with these rights. You know, I don't do a deep dive into mm-hmm. these because most people will go to sleep, myself included. So just know you do have rights is what I really want you to take away. All right, annualcreditreport.com, free resource. You can get all your reports. You don't get the score. Now, I do know since the pandemic hit, they allow you to check every month. If you need to, that, that's fine. If you're really working on cleaning some things up and you need those updates, you can check every month. Now, pre-pandemic, this was an annual thing. So once every 12 months, you get a free report from each of the three credit bureaus, just the reports, and you don't get the score. I don't like paying for the score. I would say if you are just curious about the score, use a Credit Karma or some other app or some credit cards can offer a score of some sort. But I tend to try to pull people away from the score. Here's why. If I get the report and I can see it, I can pretty much make an assessment about where your credit is. It's not that hard. You have a lot of good stuff and you pay stuff on time and all that good. It's really easy to see that you probably have a good credit score. If you come to me and say, man, my credit's a little suspect, I don't even need to see your score. Because if you tell me that, I believe it. (laughs) I I don't need the validation of a number to prove that your credit is jacked up. I just want to see that report and get to work on how do we clean it up. That is my focus with credit. That is my sole focus. Let's get the reports and let's see what story is being told about you. We got to see it. Got to see the report. So got about 15 minutes left. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about uh, settling quickly, disputing. Okay. Yeah. So, and I see we had a couple of questions. I'm going to 
settling, we could spend a whole hour on this. Look, here, here's my take on settling. It can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing. I'll say it's good from a standpoint that you're not paying the full balance that you actually owe. That's a positive. The, the, the downside is if I'm a lender and I'm looking at your report and I see that you settled for less than the full amount that you paid, maybe I don't give you as favorable terms as you should just because I see there was a situation. But I'm all for paying off debts. If I can afford to not pay you full price, I'm taking that deal. And that's just me as like, I, I, I want to take that deal. But when you're settling, there's some things you got to keep in mind. You know, make sure you owe the debt. You know, some people like to avoid the collectors. Great, avoid them, play the waiting game. But in my time, I'll find people that have, I'll say collection accounts for like $70. And it's been on there for like three or four years. And I'm just like, why don't you just pay? It's almost worth you just paying so the headache goes away. It, it's, it's worth it sometimes to just pay. Pay and get off your plate. Yes, the, the lender might not look at it as favorable if it stays on the report, but when you're settling accounts, you know, it's all about if I'm going to pay you, I'm going to have demands. So if I'm paying a collection agency, I want you to take it off my report once I've paid you and hold and, them And that's the problem though, right? A lot of them say they can't, um, you know, remove it from the um, report. Yeah, that's what they say. So how, how far will you fight for your for your freedom? Because I'm gonna keep fighting. Because <laughs> if, if, yeah. if they're not, if they're not gonna, this is, so, so we gotta take out feeling, it's business. If I'm gonna pay you, I have, I have some, um, I have some, uh, what's the one I'm looking for? Um, gosh, I can't, I'm drawing a blank. I have some demands. If I owe this money, I'm willing to pay. Here's what I need in return. And we got to put it in writing. If you take their word for it, their word is not, your word does not hold up in a court of law, which is why number six is right there. Just document everything. I don't care if they give you a fake name when you're talking to them. You give them a fake name. Like, look, I'm calling on behalf of this account number. They don't know it's you. Just call them. I'm helping out a client. <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is war. We let our feelings get involved which causes us to stay in this mess. You gotta be in this to win within the ramifications of these rules. I can negotiate. I don't have to pay you. I can make up some stories. I got other people I gotta pay. So if you can't meet my demands, then I'm gonna go use the money that I was saving. And I'm gonna go pay off some other debts. So when it, you know, if you all can't accept my offer, I'll, I'll circle back around. You can keep reaching out, but just I've, I've told you what I can do. Let's work together here. It's all about negotiation. Some, some people and collectors, they're not going to care. They're not going to try to work with you. And maybe it's just a blemish you have to deal with in the meantime. But what I also see is that we get so caught up in all the bad stuff that we forget to keep doing the good stuff. Credit is a balancing act of how much bad versus how much good do you have. I have people who got 800 scores who have bankruptcies on their report because bankruptcies stay on there for 10 years. So at some point you had to declare bankruptcy, you figured it out, got your life back on track. But the bankruptcy still show. So I don't want you to get so caught up in the, I got to focus on all the collection accounts because even paying off collectors does not boost your score dramatically. How do I know? I've seen it happen. So just be mindful that you can settle, you can negotiate. Everybody wants to win. So you, got, you have to be willing to give a little if you can, but settling could be an option if you're, if you're working on cleaning things up. Disputing. Uh, really quickly, sometimes you can get away. With, you can get away with things, and this is a rule that most people will will know about. Um, credit repair companies tout this all the time. Where we, we we're working hard for you. Sometimes they're just disputing stuff and seeing if they can prove it or not. Literally. So quick quick story about disputing. It doesn't always work. It sometimes will open you up because what you're doing is you're alerting the creditor or the collector collectors that you know you're trying to do something but you're, you're disputing things directly to the credit bureaus. So if there is some collection account that just pops up and you're like, I don't think it's me, then you want them to verify it. So that's something that you can dispute. And, and disputes, you know, there's this rule of some people love sending letters, others like doing it online. I can't verify this, but I heard it all goes into the same repository, whether you send a, a letter or you send in a virtual 
response. It all goes into this big database. Um, so disputing is good for one thing because sometimes it's just bad information that's you know not accurate, like your, your name is not spelled right, bad phone number, bad addresses. And, and this is why I focus on the report because I wanna see what story is being told before it goes into somebody's hand or they print it off or see it online. So uh, the rule around disputing, they have 30 days to respond. If you're doing disputes online, it's 45 days, but sometimes you may be able to get away with stuff. You know, I had a gentleman, he had 13 collection accounts. This is my, he's my superstar. He sat through a workshop he did. He was like, I wanna try this disputing thing. He said he owed all 13. So the guy was brutally honest, but he was like, let's test the game out and see what happens. Now, when you're disputing collections, if they're older than two years, you might have some, some better success. And for this gentleman, most of his collections were like four years and older, but we disputed all 13. They only verified three. Now he's my stand, he, he's the best case I had where he got lucky. It worked out in his favor that we disputed all of them. They couldn't verify it. And when they can't verify it from just one of the reporting, one of the bureaus, all you have to do is save that document and then you send that to the other two. Hey, everybody, all these got missing. Delete it. They have to get deleted. They can't, you know, verify it. And then you send that proof to the other two bureaus. And then that's how you get rid of older collection accounts that you might not want to pay. It's not perfect, but it's a, it's a way that might be able to help you, I'll say, do some, some cleaning of your report. All right. So three quick ways. Uh, I, want, I threw this in here kind of late uh, today, but people think you always have to like do a lot to build your credit and you don't necessarily have to. If you're just starting out or you know, you've had a, a rough go at it with your credit, a secured card is a, a great way to start or to rebuild because you're setting the limit. And, and then it's, unless you just can't manage your money effectively, you, you should be pretty safe by using a secured credit card. Uh, you can take advantage of what's called a credit builder loan. You don't necessarily uh, get any money, but what you do is you start making payments. And these payments are reported to each of the three credit bureaus. So a credit builder loan is kind of like a, it's like the opposite of a normal loan. Like in a normal loan, you apply, you get the money, start making payments. Credit builder loans, you don't get any money, you just start making payments. And then at the end, you get like a payout or some sort to like save money, to save. So a credit builder loan, you don't get a card, right? So people say, well, I gotta get a credit card. No, you don't. You do a credit builder loan and that's a great way to have a positive trade line on your report. And then the third one, I put authorized user. So I'm doing, I do this for family. I got cousins who just won't act right, but they're trying to get houses. So I was like, I'll add you <laughs> to one of my cards. They, 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 they don't get a card. I am really responsible. So they're literally riding my coattail to greatness. And so if you have some very disciplined family members who could do this, it might be an option. Again, you don't get a card. You know, my cousin wasn't great with money. So I'm, like, I'm not giving you the card, but I'll help you. So I gave her access to one of my trade lines. Hopefully she gets this house sooner or later. So here, th these are just the, the three that I like to share um, around how do you build or kind of, you know, enhance your credit score. Question. Yes, ma'am. Um, with that um, assigning, that last one, mm -hmm. get, getting added as an authorized user, do you, um, do they run credit checks to add you? No, no. Let me tell how simple it is. So, I, I tell you, I, I say I'm doing it for my cousin, right? She's she's like late forties. Um, I'm also doing this for my niece and my nephew, and my niece is six, and my nephew is eight <laughs> months. So okay. I'm I'm helping to establish their credit early by riding my coat. So Uncle Jasper is giving his niece and nephew a good head start. So if you have, they don't get a card. Like I have a physical card with their names on it. They're not going to get them into their teenagers. So I'm going to wait till they're 16. I'm going to give them the car and then I'm going to teach them how to use credit effectively. But they will have been, been building credit since they were small. Um, and all you need is their social. So I, I got their socials from my brother. I signed them up. They delivered the cars to me. 
I stay in full control. They can't make payments. They don't, they, if they get a card, they can just swipe, swipe, and I have to pay. So that's the, 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 the thing you do with authorized users is the person who's responsible stays in control, but you're doing them a solid. Mm -hmm. It's a great way. Um, I do it for some family members. I actually started charging people to do it. I was like, you know what? Y'all going to use my credit. It's going to cost you. So you're going to feed. Mm -hmm. I'm always willing to barter. So if you can't pay me, pay me in food. Pay me in. Like, I, I'm always thinking about business. What's going to help both of us? Right. Some people can't get new credit. So the credit builder loan is a great option. If you don't need a car, you just make payments. So the credit builder loan, the one that I, I refer to, I, I've done it. It's, um, you type this into your browser, self.inc. Um, I know if we're in the Bay Area, like uh, Self-Help Credit Union has one. I think it's called the Fresh Start of Self-Help Credit Union. I think it's still called the Fresh Start Loan. But look up Self-Help Credit Union. They have, um, I know one of their branches is across from West Oakland Bart Station, right? It's like the big blue sign. You can't miss them. Uh, I think it's I think it's called the Self Belt Self, self um, Fresh Start Loan. Okay, Bank of Oakland. Yeah, yeah. So just if you ask, hey, do you have like a credit builder loan product? Self Help Self Dot Inc. I know they just have an online platform. Self Help Credit Union. Again, you know, if you're if you're in the Bay Area, uh, could be an option. You can go online. I think you might be able to apply online. I'm not certain, but just you know, these are things that nobody tells you. People just think I gotta get a credit card. No, you don't. And some of you shouldn't be applying for credit. You're going to get denied, which doesn't help. Right. So, so this is a almost a surefire way to get in or get some more positive stuff on your report while you're also cleaning up the bad stuff. You got time? Can I share a little something real quick? Yeah, yeah. And I know we're almost at time. So if everybody's cool, I, I, I literally just need to go work out after this. So I got some time. to. I saw there's some questions. And we're um, almost at the end of the slide deck, but Anita, yes, go right, go right ahead. Okay, no judging. I right. went to a credit union that I get money, that I put money into every month. I tried to get the loan builder, credit builder loan, mm -hmm. tried to get a secure card. Couldn't get either one, but it's like, but you're getting money from me every month. I don't understand. But they told me that their, their loans are coming through a third party. It's not coming through them. So what do you do in that case? Find I tried. No, find, find another financial institution. Yeah. That's but it. then, you know, they keep running your credit, though, and that's not good. So I'm avoiding that because I don't want it to drop any more because of hard inquiries. So, so I'm kind of like stuck between a rock and a hard place. No, I disagree. What's it worth to you to take one more inquiry to actually get approved? And it, it, sh it should be secure car or credit builder. And, and again, if you're, if you're leery on trying again, you better find some people with good credit and be an authorized user. I mean, yeah. what's well, it worth you to take? Like taking another hard inquiry to get what you want. That's like me taking a punch, but not falling and I still win the fight, right? I took a few punches. So, so we, we act as if we have no options in America. If your bank of credit union says no, go somewhere else. They don't yeah. deserve your business. We, we just feel like we're, we have to give Bank of America, Wells Fargo, City, and Chase, all of our business. You got credit unions, you got regional banks, you got yeah. online platforms. We, we are so brainwashed into thinking it has to be this way or else I can't get it done. On the flip side, wealthy people go to the ends of the earth to get exactly what they want. And if you say no to me, you don't deserve my business. Right. You're not trying to help me. Right. Why I did I? Yeah. Oh, Can I ahead, just let her know that... Um, First United Credit Union, she could get a secured loan and they don't run a credit check for that. Um, Provident Credit Union, if you put 500 or whatever amount, they'll give you a loan. They don't run a credit check for a secured loan. Say it again. Give me those two names. <laughs> uh, First United Credit Union. Uh huh. And then Provident Credit Union. Okay. Um, and even Chevron Credit Union, they don't run a credit for a secured loan. Mm, okay. But yeah. Thank you. <laughs> See, you, yeah, you, you have options. So, so but this, this is indicative of what most people will say. Oh, they said no. I'll give you an example. 
if anybody's married, did you make did you get married after the first sight? Whoever you married to, or did you keep trying? Because I know when a woman said no to me, I was like, she that means no today. I'm gonna try her again next week. And now I'm yeah. getting married in July. So now, I mean, what what, what kind of story? So this this is we gotta keep fighting. And, and I think it's because we've been so beat down that we're almost afraid to try. And I yeah. think that's where we talked about last night with your your emotions and the behaviors that we don't even believe it's possible because nobody who looks like me or you is telling them, you know, you can do something else, right? You know, you can try something else. If at first you don't su succeed, try, try again. But we just give up. Well, no. Okay. If yeah, everybody's said, understanding your value, it is a relationship. So do you want to be involved with someone who, where it's very easy for them to deny you? I don't. You know, I want someone who, who's going to be like, oh, maybe I really should sit, seriously, seriously consider this. Otherwise, she may walk, you know. Yeah. It is a relationship. It is. It is. And because they're making money off you and you're, <laughs> you're, right, you're doing business with them in hopes that when you need something, you can go to them and get it. Right. Right. I, I am not going to be loyal to you if you're not even trying to help me. Right. And, 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 and we... So, so I went through this with the whole uh, banking black movement, if you're into that. So people are like, well, I can't get everything at my black bank. I'm like, well, give them more deposits. They will improve all of their stuff. But you can't complain about what they're not offering if you're not supporting them. And we do that all the time with various financial institutions. Well, they can't do this. Well, there's a reason why. And she just mentioned it. If they don't have the deposits, they can't offer you the most incredible online platform or the most incredible app, or they may not be able to process business loans. Like if there's always gonna be some hang up because they don't have the deposits. So if you leave one of the big four and go to any other financial institution, you almost have to lower your expectation, but they still should treat you right. Level of treat service. Like right, so your $2 is just as important as the $2 million. And yeah. if they find a problem with that, and this is why a lot of people like credit unions because you're a member versus, a sh you know, you're just an account. You're yeah. just a customer. Right. You're a value yeah. customer. Right. So credit unions, you're a member. They make decisions on behalf of the members. So it's a different vibe, you know, but again, you got to find out who's giving you the best service. So if you stay yeah. with the big players, are you, get are you getting the service that you want and deserve? If not, it's time to make a change. In a bad relationship, they're not helping you. No. Yes. Thank you. You got it. So three things I want everybody to take away from this is credit. You can mess it up, fix it up, mess it up, fix it up. And you can keep doing this forever in life. The goal is fix it, get it to a point where it's good, and you maintain and do all the right things that you should be doing. Uh, second point, get that free report. Check them out. You know, again, if you're a Credit Karma fan, look, you're missing a third piece of the puzzle, at least go get the experience report to make sure it all checks out. But we got to get those free reports to see what's going on. Because again, the story's being told. Some of us don't know what the story is, and yet the story is about you. So I need you to be proactive. And you should never be surprised, ever. You should never be surprised about what's happening. You should know it, get in front of it. And if you have to delay some of your goals, delay them it's worth it <laughs> it's worth you taking the extra time to clean things up it's worth it and the last one you know whether you pay debts off in full you settle dispute you gotta keep the receipts and document everything that you do what will hold up in a court of law your word or proof that's all i say to that i don't care what they tell you what you say how you pay just if there's not a record or a receipt and something else comes up, you're going to be in a bad situation. You say, but I paid them. You sure? Where's the paperwork? And you're going to owe it again. So you got to take, got to take this time to document everything that you're doing. And so I want to leave you all the homework assignment. It's pretty, pretty simple. You know, get those reports, which I've already mentioned, but this last bullet point, and I'm just being mindful of the time because I know we got, I, I saw quite a few questions. I know I'm not going to be able to get to all of them, but you got to have an attack plan and you got to prioritize things accordingly. 
And, and this sometimes maybe you need the help of an expert. You know, I'm not a huge fan of all the credit repair people out there because some of them are crooks, but it might be worth you making a small investment to get the help. But if you don't get the credit report first, I think you're, you're like missing a step because you can do that for free. Just take a look at it. And, and on all these platforms, they, can, they give you like diagrams on how to read through it. So I, I think sometimes we want that quick fix, but sometimes it's worth you doing this because some of y'all got yourself in a situation and now you're like, I need somebody to bail me out. And, and if you can pay, pay, but I, I don't want you necessarily to start paying for stuff. And I know if you took a little bit of time, it would just work out. Like, you know who you didn't pay. You can just scroll down to that account. Yep, I was 30, ooh, I was 60 days left. Like you can see that kind of stuff. So I don't want you to be in a hurry to pay these services because a lot of times all they're doing is sending some dispute letter and waiting 30 days for a response. You could have done that on your own. What else are they helping you with? Are they helping you with budgeting? Are they helping you with, you know, you have, like, what else are they doing if you're paying somebody $99 a month? I think that money could be better served somewhere else if you just took the time to create an attack plan. And the plan has got to be for you. There's no one size fits all strategy with financial planning and definitely not no one, definitely not a one size fits all with credit uh, enhancement, credit improvement. It's just we got to look at the whole situation. Once you got the whole situation out, then you start.